Welcome back to our Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. Uh, I'm very proud to introduce today to you uh, Lip Bhutan, who is the chairman and founder of Walden International. And um, Walden has basically pioneered the concept of US venture capital in Asia. Uh, Lipbu is on the board of, and I think this is an approximate number, I've got a list of all the companies he's on the board of here, but um, I'm going to say approximately eight companies, seven or eight. I have a feeling that this has changed, <laughs> changed over time. Um, he, he says more than that, more than eight. And um, uh, on a more uh, personal side, uh, he's on the board of the San Francisco Opera, and he is also an avid uh, sports person. Uh, both uh, volleyball and basketball, if I am correct, are his, his uh, original uh, great interests, at least on the sports side. So with this, Lip Bhutan. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Can you hear me at the back? OK, good. Thank you. So delighted to be here. And uh, you know, I think uh, almost uh, 30 years ago, I was, I'm not like you sitting uh, in the audience and uh, listen to the speaker to speak. And in fact, uh, I will share with you and uh, some of my experience and uh, how to get to where I am. Uh, just to make sure that this works here. Yeah? And great. Um, so anyway, I came from uh, born in Malaysia, educated in Singapore, did my undergrad uh, in physics, and then uh, you know, the, maybe I cut short my uh, program. I only did three years uh, uh, undergrad, and so I miss a lot. And uh, so the school is very smart, so make, make sure that I go back and work. So he, they draft me for trustee last, last year, and so that I had to every f four times a year, I had to get back to, uh, to, to the school. And they're also asking me to chair the advisory board. So they really make me work uh, to pay up that one year that I skipped. Um, then I went to nuclear engineering. And I thought the energy problem is a bigger crisis, uh, even though I was accepted to get the PhD in physics and also in double E. And uh, I look back, you know, I think maybe you know, the, when I almost finished my PhD and then the Three My Island accident happened, as you all know, there's no nuclear power plant built after that, and uh, until recently, get approved another you know, 40 uh, nuclear power plant going to be built. So I'm about, about almost uh, 25 years ahead of the uh, market. So sometimes it's just hard to plan your career, and you plan it perfectly, but somehow you just miss that. And um, you know, it's a very strange uh, school that I'm in at MIT, and uh, you feel like working because you know, your relationship with the professor is like kind of boss and their student. And so, unfortunately, the PhD uh, class that I want to take is a nuclear reactor. A professor told me that, you know, uh, first of all, he won't give grant to students, especially, especially his Chinese students. I said, OK, fine. But I still like your class. And uh, then the dean was kind of take a pity on me. He said, well, well, you don't have a t research uh, grant. And so why don't you work for me? And uh, I pay you. So I did. So I do part free for a professor for my thesis, and I work for the dean and uh, for my, uh, to get paid. And um, then later on, this dean is very nice. He said, Lipo, I found out that your professor did you want to do a PhD. By the way, you should, you should take my as a professor for a PhD, convince me for one year. And uh, he's not able to convince me to change my mind. I still like to work for that professor. And uh, he said, that, well, he's writing a grant, and maybe you can help him. And then you can get paid for it. So I did went to the professor and said, well, I heard that you're putting a grant. And I can help you to you know, prepare the grant. And uh, long and behold, he got the grant. And he had no choice. He had to accept me as, uh, to pay me. And then the, the dean kind of very frustrated. I said, hey, look, you know, when you don't have any tuition pay, and then I get you to work for me, and then now you have a grant, and you cannot drop me. So they have to continue working. So I would basically work two, two shifts. And uh, usually, I go to the bursar office to get my check. So something must be wrong. Every student only got one check. You got two checks. And uh, so I did that for a couple of years. And then uh, and almost when I finished my PhD, the two professors still don't let me go. So I came to San Francisco working. And every weekend, I still had to fly to MIT to work for those uh, two professors. And they're kind of you know, very kind to me. And so 
Um, one advice that the dean gave me is very good. So I told him that I'm going to not finish a PhD. I'm going to change. So the liberal, I'm going to give you 10 years. Anytime you can come back. And uh, even recently, he said, the liberal, you, have you changed your mind? He said, no, after 30 years, I haven't changed my mind. And uh, so he gave me a very good advice I thought would be shared with you is that uh, he said, well, liberal, you know, go out. And I asked him, you know, do you have any advice for me? He said, well, just keep the eye open, take calculated risks, and, um, and be bold and make calculated risks. And that had been the best advice I get you know, from MIT. And I'm very happy with that. And all my life, I've been taking risks, and I enjoy doing that. And now they again, they you know, asked me to, I finished in one year and a half, so they asked me to pay for my deal. So uh, right now I'm on the visiting committee and the dean advisory board. Um, I did my MBA part time at USF, and uh, because I'm an entrepreneur with one startup company. And uh, one thing good is at the end of the, one of the classes, the one speaker was uh, speaking, and I asked a lot of questions. And I thought that he was going to be upset at me. And he, in fact, invited me for lunch. And then uh, from one day, and consulting to him, and eventually I joined him. So sometimes the speaker talking, I think, uh, feel free to ask questions. And you'll be surprised. They may not be upset, and they may hire you. Um, my work experience working for nuclear engineering for a while, and then um, you know, for you know, the EDS Nuclear, our biggest client is Bechtel and GE. And then, um, then I start a company with a couple of guys, and then doing you know, the water hammer, we are developing the code. Uh, they, you know, sometimes you are younger, and then you, they just ask you to work more. And so three other founders asking me, since you are the youngest, so you had to develop the code. So I had to develop the code. The industry today is still using it. And then also, by the way, you, know, you are the youngest, you have no choice, you have to be the CFO. And I don't even know what the CFO do. And so he said, well, don't worry about it. We send you to USF part-time. At night, you balance a book. and morning, you do developing codes. That's what I did. And so, and so I survived that. And eventually, the company sold. Went into private equity in an investment banking firm for a while. And then I don't like the transaction-oriented business. I like to build business. So eventually, joined Warden. And then I joined the Warden Group. It's a very small firm. And uh, you know, I told them that managing about 30 million at that time, 1984. And I raised the first fund, you know, it was a three million fund, it's a really hard one. I had to talk to my father-in-law, talk to my father, and everybody else I know to raise that money. And it's a painful one, three million. And then uh, long and behold, this throughout the whole year, I you know, raised a firm and you know, close to three billion under management. And, uh, and we spin off the Israel side, and we spin off the media side. And then I run the international side. So that's a little bit of my background. So I think the, in the summary is sometimes you just can't plan your career and then you just have to take life in you know, a fun uh, journey and then uh, just uh, you know, uh, keep your eye open and then, uh, and then grab the opportunity when you come and take some risks. And um, that is the fun part of it. Right now, I basically focus on the IT only, uh, semiconductor component communications. And software, I did, I did all three. And then uh, lately, I've been more focused on semiconductor because I felt that there's a lot of innovation still and I can make a lot of money. Uh, just to share a little bit on some of my experience. And um, you know, I, when I joined this industry, I decided that it's very important to be you know, the global approach to investment. And uh, I, did, I saw that when I decided to enter the VC business. And I said, that I want to be an impact player. And what can I offer? And I come from Asia. And I said, OK, the best way I can do is to help US portfolio to go to Asia, how to do build R&D, and uh, build manufacturing, lower the cost, and then build new market and, like, in Japan, in China. So I did that a few years. Then the next thing is you know, try to say, OK, maybe I can invest in some company that work in US, modify and apply in Asia. And, uh, and then the thirdly, try to help company in Asia to become a global company. And so. I've been doing that for the last you know, 20 plus year, you know, until Tom Friedman talking about the world is flat, and then, uh, you know, then everybody gets excited about this global investment. And I've been doing that for the last 20 plus year. Uh, so just show you a few examples. Uh, one is Sina. It's a company that when I invest in China called Stone Ridge Site, and they're doing some kind of software development for Microsoft on a contract basis. And then, uh, then I invest into a company in US uh, called Sina.net, and I said, well, why don't you guys two combine and merge together? 
and then that's from a Sina and addressing the internet uh, you know, portal, the news portal. So it's a little bit like Yahoo in China. And so with a very small team in Taiwan, uh, in Beijing, and then we grow today as a $2 billion company, market cap company, the largest in China. And um, so it's kind of fun. At one time, we own about 30% of the company, the large, you know, largest shareholders. And I'm still on the board and have a lot of fun building this company. And uh, a lot of people want to buy this asset. Uh, unfortunately, government are not allowed them to buy. You know, Google, Yahoo, everybody want to buy this company. Uh, but the go our government said, no, this is a primary asset we cannot sell. And so, you know, it's a very long process and uh, we get the license. And uh, usually foreigners cannot own a media company in China. And then uh, I negotiate a lot with the government back to back structure so that we foreigner can own this piece of asset and uh, it's, it's a wonderful company. Uh, the other company you know, the, um, you know, I helped started seven years ago called MyTree. Uh, this is a guy, Ashok, used to run uh, Wipro and uh, build it up to one of the largest IT service company. So this again, you know, just addressing this outsourcing opportunity and, uh, and the guy is just really good in executions. And um, he told me five years ago he said that he's gonna build a hundred million dollars company and I said, great, call me in you know, over the breakfast, and I write the check for him. And then uh, he didn't disappoint me, and then seven years passed, and now uh, he's running an almost uh, 200 million run rate company. And then it's very interesting, the company just went public in India, market cap is about 800 million, and we're the largest shareholder, I'm still on this board. And then um, surprisingly, when we went to the banker and we said about the lockup, you know, how, how much time we're gonna lock up, cannot sell the shares. And then the management surprised me, they lock up three years. And I asked them, why on earth you guys lock up for three years, not selling any piece of shares? I said, well, our commitment is to reach one billion. So we took six years to bring up to 100 million. There's the fastest one in India. So that we're gonna be the fastest one to get to reach one billion. And I said, okay, in that case, I can't call me in. I will stay on to help you guys to build it. So it's kind of fun to build business you know, from scratch, from zero, and then build it up, and then have a vision to be a billion dollars company. The other one is, you know, just, uh, you know, if you play, you know, computer in the sound, you know, the sound blaster, and then this is a creative technology. And I still remember he's not even a college graduate, and uh, he's a technician. And then uh, he came to me one day, he called me up, and I said, Lipu, I'm going to come over uh, on Singapore Airline and, and, and uh, visiting you. And I said, sure, I will stay in the office for you. And he came at about 7.30, and we didn't have dinner, so I wait for him. And so he came over and he told me that he had a dream, he wanted to be a billion dollars company. And I said, how big are you now? And he said, well, about one million revenue. And then doing clone computer. And then, the, the, then I explained to him, you know, take, Apple take how many years to get there to one billion? And I tried to pour some cold water for him that, you know, just be realistic. And he's very ambitious. He said, well, I'm gonna be a billion dollars in uh, revenue. I said, okay. And so about 11.30 at night, and I said, well, you know, I haven't had any dinner, and then, but uh, you know, the, do you mind when to go to dinner together and, uh, in San Francisco? And he said, sure. And just keep talking, talking, and then uh, at the end, I said, Lippo, you know, I'd like you to be on my board. And I said, well, I just can't in, be on your board unless you let me invest. And he said, okay, Lippo, you know, the, we are profitable, but if you want to be investing, fine, we will let, let you to invest. So we have a gap in you know, the valuation. He has something in mind and I have something in the other gap. The gap is very wide. So finally I said, well, look, it's almost 1.30 in the morning and I got to go back to see my wife. And, uh, but um, why don't we do this? You accept my proposal on the valuations. And then if you are so confident about next three years profitability, and I, I will reverse that, I will dilute myself so that you get to your valuation, your ownership that you want. And then he immediately you know, stretched stretch out his hand and said, we have a deal. And so that's how we did the deal investment. And then uh, long and behold, three years passed. And uh, he beat every number. And uh, so the time came, we had to go public. And um, you know, I bought him a shirt. And then he still wears you know, the uh, uh, white sock. And I said, well, go to the Wall Street. You can't do that. You know? So I had to shopping with him. and then. Um, and, uh, and then and I show it to Goldman Sachs chairman, he's a good friend of mine, I said, well, that time is Steven, and uh, Steve, and I said, Steve, you know, this company wants to go public, and you know, a beautiful number, and um, you know, what, what do you think? He said, it's one single product, and you know, it's gonna be hard to bring it public. And then uh, secondly, 
what kind of valuation you have in mind? So I talked to this guy, Sim. I said, well, what kind of valuation you have in mind? He said, well, Microsoft went public at 500 million, and he wanted to have 500 million and one dollar. And uh, so I told the chairman of Goldman, I said, well, he won 500 million and one. And um, he said, well, so nice to meet you guys. And Libu, thanks for bringing him in. What's your next stop? And I showed him the address. It's the Morgan Stanley. And then uh, this, you know, he's very smart. He said, forget about Morgan Stanley. And uh, we'll make a deal here. And so he decided to commit to do the IPO. And a long story short, the company went public. And then before IPO, we have a problem. Is, you know, our agreement with Sim is for three years but it's only two and a half years. And so Sim come to me and said, Lippo, what do you think? Do you want to surrender and then uh, accept my proposal? And I said, I look at the number. I said, well, Sim, now you're going to be the number. So may as well surrender. <laughs> so we did. And uh, so I go to his, went to his uh, number. And then long and behold, it's a great return for everyone. And uh, he's done well. And, uh, and I'm still on his board. And uh, he reached more than one billion in revenue. And um, so just another good story. Last one, you know, we decided to build a wafer fab in China. It's a very capital intensive, but the guy is really good. And then uh, I back him. I've been on his board, and I chair his audit and compensation committee. And the company is doing about 1.8 billion this year. And uh, so just to show you that it, it, there's a t determination. If the guy is very committed, and the sky's the limit. And uh, I strongly believe in hardworking. All four companies, their CEO work really hard. And then the, they, they make their dream. And uh, I'm just nice to be part of that. Um, just a little bit background. And then I'm heavily in semiconductor. And this is the list of company that I'm involved. And uh, from multi-core. And uh, you know, this is a team that I spin, uh, spin off a team, a professor from MIT. And uh, they just tape out 64 core. So you know, the Sun or Microsoft, uh, Sun or Intel, is doing eight core, and we tape out 64 core, and it's working, not on wood, and uh, as of yesterday. And then our next project is 128 core. So it's a very technically challenging um, architecture design, and we, I love it. And uh, I've been looking at FPGA. This is a program, programmable ASIC. And I just committed after looking at three, three years intensive look, finally I found one that I really like. And then uh, hopefully we'll change the whole FPGA landscape. And uh, that includes even the founder of uh, uh, um, Altera is joining me and, uh, to, to build that. So it's kind of fun you know, in the VC business. You, know, you meet the brightest people, and then uh, you just help them to grow and fulfill their dream. And then some fail, and some really successful, and just be delighted to be part of that. And um, so those are some of my investments I make, and, and uh, uh, include a couple of them from Berkeley. Uh, one is uh, Queen Tech. This is on the mobile side. Actually, the founder is Professor Chen Ming Wu and uh, my neighbors. And then uh, we back that and include Dado Panatao as the chairman with me. And uh, we're delighted to do that. And there's another one called Telligent. Uh, this is Professor Paul Gray and his students. And then I'm delighted to back in the mobile TV related area. So Berkeley have a lot of entrepreneurs. And uh, Equest, this is uh, Mihai from uh, Berkeley. And uh, so he's doing the fab, fab automation system. And I'm just delighted to be you know, uh, part of him and uh, working with him. So we have a lot of entrepreneurs from Berkeley. And this is a wonderful place. And I live only 15 minutes away from here. And I'm just excited to be you know, at the campus here. Um, now, a lot of people felt that you know, Sabin, Oxley, and it's a time you know, a lot of venture firm, after, before IPO, they resign. And I thought that this is something is, you know, they're missing a lot. And I look at IPO as just part of the process of growth and financing. And so I strongly believe, and in fact, I stay on the board and on the public company. And uh, especially the team that I'm very familiar, you know, I learn a lot from them. And then uh, you know, Cadence, you know, the, I still remember when they recruit me to join the board. And then uh, Alberto, Professor Alberto at Berkeley here, and, um, uh, invite me to join the board, and then uh, I helped the company. Initially, a little bit scared. You know, this is a billion dollars company, and then they asked me to join the board. What can I do for them? And I strongly believe is if you work hard enough, and um, and then you earn your spot. And then uh, you know, just one example. And I'm not as technical as those guys. And then uh, they draft me. Alberto and the CEO draft me to be on the technology committee. And uh, is you know, I didn't know what I commit to it. 
you know, they are really deep dive into the whole uh, EDA space. And uh, long and behold, it's almost like by every two weeks, they have one meeting. And uh, it's four hours meeting. And then you just learn a lot from that. And then all the CTO, the VP of engineering. And then you have no choice. You just have to do your homework. And I still remember, you know, it's fun, you know, after our school, still learning a lot, you know, in the work. And then, um, and then long and behold, I contribute. And then, um, then uh, the CEO come from Intel. And then uh, he said that, well, Lippo, you know, recently there's some changes on the board. Is that, that, you know, I said, well, maybe I should step out of the board. I said, no, 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 no. Everybody else can step up, not you. You stay. And so in a way, it's kind of like validate you earn your sport. And so one message to you is, you know, don't, don't think that you are the youngest and you are not the smartest guy, but if you work hard enough, and then uh, you can earn your sport. I'm the youngest on the, among the board member, and then um, I earn my sport. Same thing with Factronics. Some of you may know CEO of Michael, Michael Marks. And then uh, he recruited me to join the board. And then uh, same thing, you know, recently we're going to have some board uh, re reorganization. And I said, Michael, maybe I should step out the board. Said, no, 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 no. Everybody else can step out the board. You stay. And so again, you know, the, um, just being able to help and participate and then contribute. And uh, people appreciate that. And, um, and then you can really earn your sport. And uh, for me, it's very exciting to learn a company, $20 billion company. And uh, not only learning, and also help and contribute and in terms of customer. And I back a lot of companies back become the chipset that make them unique and win some business. And that turned out to be a very, very helpful for them. Um, some of you may ask, you know, what are my hot area that I'm looking at? And, um, you know, I don't like the word called hot, you know, because sometimes it's hot, it's maybe overfunded. Uh, but this is the area that I like and I'm paying attention to. Uh, open source, I think it's a very big initiative. Uh, uh, last few days, I've been spending time with uh, Sun Microsystem, with Jonathan and uh, uh, some of his crew. And uh, the whole so software as service, uh, selling as a service, I think is a very big thing. Uh, we're a big believer and we're biggest shareholder in the company called Sugar CRM uh, in, this, in, our, in our customer relationship management, but not selling as a license. But you know, I think the CEO may be here, he's quite active uh, in Berkeley. I think there was a speaker about a year ago. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I like him a lot. And we're the big fan. And one of my partner, Mary Coleman, uh, you know, she, uh, she's uh, used to be in the Arum software and in the software uh, CRM. And in fact, she even helped, you know, shaping up the whole business plan. And that's why we were selected to be the lead in that. And so we're delighted on that. Web 2.0, I think, you know, it's, there's going to be a big uh, conference coming up in, uh, this, uh, this month. And uh, there's a student discount, by the way, 60%. So if you like, you know, you should, uh, you know, that there's a once a year. Very exciting web 2.0 in terms of the you know, user generating uh, content and all the um, applications. So I think that's going to be a big trend. Uh, mobile application is a very big thing. And uh, you know, usually you know, the Intel built from the notebook and computer, you know, imagine how much more in the handset device. And then with so much power and the storage and and so, you know, there's a lot of application, and this is going to be a big frontier. Uh, in some way, I was disappointed that Intel kind of go back to the notebook and uh, you know, sold that whole mobile business to Marvell. And so I think um, that's going to be a huge market. Uh, the whole triple play audio, date, you know, video, I think video is going to be a very big thing. Uh, the wireless, the next 4G, you know, I'm a big believer in WiMAX. I back a company called BSIM. Uh, it's going to be a big home run for us. We're very excited. We team up with Sequoia on that. Uh, video compression going to be big. You know, the whole HD quality, uh, that is going to be a huge area. And it's changing the whole landscape. And uh, so I think it's on and on. And then the data center is a very big one. How do you address a congestion area? Uh, I started a company called Tick Network uh, with a couple of guys at uh, Cisco. And I just got uh, Michael Marx to join me on that deal. And so as of today, and we are moving forward to build a great company. And so I think just give you a flavor of some of the area that at least I'm focusing on. Uh, just give you an example, you know, this class, you know, I think this globalization is happening now. And um, there's a lot of talent and uh, in India, in China, you know, you heard about 300 engineers per year they generate uh, from university. And it's true, it's happening. And, um, you know, the whole cost design 
uh, when you move down the geometry, either in the semiconductor side or some of the software, you just cannot ignore the talent pool in uh, other part of the world. Uh, U.S. is not just this, you know, not no more as a central gravity. It's very dis distributed now. So you know, you're in a startup company. You day one, you have to think about globalization. And so, just give you two examples that I back. Uh, one is called BSIM. It's a WiMAX company, and 60% uh, of their R&D team is in India. And a 24 hours turnaround time is very low cost, and um, and uh, you know, and it's just amazing. And then the world market, you know, U.S. is still slow in deployment. Korea, India, China, and uh, Japan are rolling out. And uh, so, so the market, you know, you know, like cell phone, you know, the U.S. is way behind. You know, right now, a few years ago, already very hot in mobile gaming. Until recently, U.S. become very hot in mobile gaming. And so, it's just telling you that the uh, certain market, uh, you have to think of global uh, market as a whole when you started. Another example is Umbrella. This is the video uh, compression. And this is the former CQ team that I back. 60% of their IMD team is in Taiwan. And uh, so that low cost uh, approach of uh, bringing the product in a very fast 24 hours and close to the customer, that make a big difference. And then most of the consumer electronics is uh, Korea and Japan. Yes. Very good question. And uh, so, first of all, in terms of the advanced architecture design, it's all done in US. And because they are close to the technology, and secondly, uh, you know, they're close to the customer, they know what is the leading edge. So good news to if you are an engineer, they still have a lot of opportunity in US because the architecture level design, China, India is still further behind. And that part has to be done in US. The IP has to be done in US. But the actual coding and the software development can be done in India, can be done in Taiwan, can be done in China. But even saying that, and the most important uh, advice I will give to the company on to do that, it's very important to have a very strong general manager. And without that, you most likely you're going to fail. And uh, even though it's attractive, you end up maybe even more costly, and you are more bucky in your development, and the quality is horrible. And so unless you have a really good top general manager and then uh, to managing that, otherwise you're asking for trouble. Um, next one, just to highlight to you the emerging of China and India. And if you look at the number, 300, almost 400 million uh, mobile users in China compared to US is 200. And then if you look at the internet, they have 100. But don't forget, their internet, they're using only one account you know, the family maybe have four or five members using that. So there's a multiple effect. And in fact, the, according to Mary Meek, a good friend of mine at Morgan Stanley, and uh, age 25 and below, China is number one now, uh, in terms of the internet user, uh, so surpass US. And so you can just look at that mobile slash uh, internet ratio is 3 point, you know, almost four to one, and that is incredible. Uh, platform in terms of mobile applications. And um, so by 2010, China talking about 800 million mobile users. And so that is a very big, you know, if you look at the China mobile, the subscriber base, and uh, it's bigger than the, 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 the every carrier combined in US. And uh, so it's a very big one. And then India is coming up very rapidly. And uh, per month is talking about, you know, seven or eight million per sub increase in user. And so those 500 million uh, user, and then uh, uh, I, I believe in those numbers. So this is a big tool market is coming up and uh, tremendously opportunity that happen in US, it can happen in China. So like for example, you know, when we have Yahoo in US, and I built you know, uh, Sina in China, and then the US you have 51, and now you have the monster.com, China have 51 jobs. And uh, so, you almost have some equivalent uh, uh, company, and then India is slightly behind China, and so that is a very exciting uh, opportunity to invest. Lastly, I just want to share with you, and now this is a very interesting book, and uh, highly recommend if you are interested in uh, called Blueprint to Billion by David uh, Thompson. It's a highly recommended book, and I really like it, the book. 
And it summarized very well and then the blueprint to build to a billion dollars company. And that's something that I'm very passionate about because you know, over, over so many years I built a successful company and uh, you know, the, the, always the goal you know, being a VC is to build a billion dollars, not just market cap, billion dollars revenue. And um, you know, if you look at the statistic, it's kind of interesting. Since 1980, 7,454 companies went public. Only 5% reached 1 billion, and less than 1% reached 10 billion revenue. And so that's how you define success company and a sustainable company. And there's no secret, you know, they have you know, seven key points. And I want to highlight you know, a couple of points. One is the, I call it the category killer. Uh, you know, you have uh, one successful entrepreneur from Berkeley uh, called Sihat uh, Marvel, and uh, he just out-designed his competitor. He identified the big market, storage, and networking, and then he just out-execute, out-designed his competitor. We call it the kill, uh, category killer. Either lower price and higher performance, and then you just clean up the, the, the market. And then uh, and this whole globalization, China and India, so whoever able to bring the cost lowest and then bring the highest performance, and in some way Google is doing the same thing, and then he provides you with the lower cost and you can access into the market and change the whole uh, dynamic of software. And even Microsoft doesn't know how to react to that when you give software free <laughs> and in some way. And then they find a different way to monetize the money through advertising. And then same thing, you know, I spent time with uh, Jonathan at Sun and he said, that, well, you know, now I'm a new CEO, I'm changing the whole landscape. You know, instead of proprietary, uh, you know, the Solaris software, I'm gonna just license it out. And I will find figure out another way to make money. And I think he's very smart. I think he's going to be very successful. And uh, secondly, is, you know, I think it's very important, you know, all in our life is we need a one major break. And if you look at Microsoft, the major break is from IBM. And IBM gave them the first contract. And that is kind of, I call it the, you know, the marquee, you know, Big Brothers Alliance. And uh, so if you look at you know, Marvell, you look at almost every single company, they have one major break. And one customer take faith in them, and let them try it, and then they scale. And so you know, in our life, it's the same way. And then uh, all you need is you know, one major break. You know, if you've, how many have seen a movie called Pursuit of Happiness? Right? Isn't that a fun movie? I mean, it just, all you need is just one simple break that somebody invite you to the game, and then you connect the network, and you get a business card. And that's all you need, you know. So sometimes it's, uh, it's important, you know, get to the right crowd and then hanging to the right people and then uh, just at the right place at the right time. And then uh, and, uh, you just have to grab the opportunity with your eye open. And so with that, you know, I, think I want to stop right here so that we have some questions that you may have. I think it's more fun to do that. Yes. Good questions. Um, first of all, I think a uh, good part about, sorry? Sure. Okay, great. So I think your question is in the, uh, on the many, many different board, uh, do you find it difficult to add value and, and contribute and learn? And so answer the question is, you know, you just have to learn as much as you can. And, uh, you know, one thing good about this business is some, always have something new. People have new idea, new concept. And uh, you just have to be a fast learner. And so sometimes I look back, you know, the school, you know, training is good. You know, let me train how to, you know, think through issue and solve problem. And, uh, but in some way, you know, it's continuous learning. And uh, so uh, one part, one good part about the, you know, in US is, you know, you have a choice of what you want to do. And, uh, and then you can pick the thing that you can continue learning. And then uh, you just have to continue learning um, and then the other thing is to try to create net value adding and uh, that take time to train yourself and then equip and then, uh, and then build a network. So a lot of VC guy, you know, may not be the smartest guy. Uh, if you ask for no Kostla, I mean, he's not the smartest guy, but he always depend on the people around him he can call and uh, to get advice and then learn along the process. So that's what the network all about and then we, look at the deal, you know, we were able to find the right people to tell us whether this is really breakthrough or not, and before we make the investment. So, 
So they think that is a part of a value adding you just accumulate over time. Did I answer your questions? Okay, thank you. Any other question you may have? Yes. Uh, and successful and unsuccessful example. Good question. So the the example of some of the failure. Um, couple of really standout failure is uh, I invest uh, in a guy called Kamran Ilahian uh, called Momenta. Some of you may have heard of it. It's a pen-based computer. And uh, and uh, it's a very successful entrepreneur. This is a third startup. Sometimes I'm always very nervous about someone the third time because they believe they can walk on water. And then secondly, they're not a very good listener. Uh, they only listen to their own ego. And then the thirdly, and our the you know, idea is great, but the market is not ready. And I still remember I argue with him that you know the product is very bucky. Don't waste the money to to launch the uh, marketing and throw a lot of money to build. And so the bottom line is, product is not working. The market is not quite ready, and in the, he just threw away the money. And uh, at the end of it, he's become a very good friend of mine because uh, I told him he's a horrible CEO, and he shouldn't be any time to be a CEO. And then, so after one year and a half, uh, we become very close friends. We've done a lot of deal together. And uh, he took my advice. he would never be a CEO again. And he become a great chairman. And I would do any time a deal with him if he's a chairman. And uh, so he, every time I, before I opened my mouth, he said, I know, I know, you don't want me to be the CEO. And I'm going to look for someone to, to, to be the CEO. So junk, wrong, wrong timing and uh, product is not ready. And then most of the time is the management. And we back the wrong guy, and, um, and, um, and uh, we fail on that, because execution is very important. And then lately, the, you learn the hard way for me is, you know, I learned from some of my friends at Sequoia, Mark, Mike Morris, uh, he backed Google and Yahoo. And then really important is look at the big market. Sometimes you just, I know I always believe when I went to this business, management, management, management is most important. Sometimes it's wrong. Market and market and market is more important. If you address a big market, people can change. Uh, you can replace and uh, you can fix. And, uh, but if you address a market is narrow, even you have the best management team, so what? You, know, you may not be able to reach the big home run that you're looking for. Yes. Very good question. I think it's a very relevant question. My advice to you is sometimes it's good to travel to China and India and then uh, and get to know where are the competitive landscape and how good they are. And then, uh, then you come back home, you know where are the areas you focus on. And so I think US have a lot to offer and it's still a very big gap you know, in terms of the understanding of the customer requirement, the, you know, the understanding the market and distribution and uh, Asia is still very weak, and there tend to be more you know, the ODM or you know, contracts you know, uh, design. So like India is very strong in outsourcing design service, but they don't have their own original product ideas, and not, not quite there yet. And the same thing in China, in Taiwan, very strong in ODM. You know, the customer tell them what to do. They can improve it very good with that. But if you ask them to really developing their own product, they're not quite there yet. Only a few selective ones that done well. And so there's still a very wide gap. So origination of ideas, creativity, and uh, now I'm on the board of Singapore University. They all want to mirror, mirror image and follow Berkeley, Stanford, or Harvard. And I told the chancellor, he's a good friend of mine, I said that you can't, you know, unless you change that whole mindset. You know, the government had to allow people to fail and then be creative. And uh, in fact, Singapore government asking me to be an advisor with Simon Ho. How can we repeat you know, like what the US have you know, to, to create Google and Yahoo? And then I told them, you know, un unless you change the whole education system, and uh, rather than very syllabus-oriented, and then do some project and, then, and allow people to fail. 
So in fact, Kamran, Kamran Elahian, a good friend of mine that I back him at Momenta, we fail. He also on the advisory board to the government in Singapore. And then he is so funny. I mean, he told the government, you know what? I'm going to create an award. It's called Phoenix Award. Uh, give every year the most honest failure entrepreneur. And the government looked at us. You, might, you guys must be nuts. What are you talking about giving failure award? And I said, yeah. This is exactly the idea. If you want to be successful in entrepreneurship, you have to let people fail and, uh, and then award them, encourage them to make some mistake. So if you, you know, ask me who are the people I back, sometimes you say that, well, you have to be a track record, the CEO to back. In some cases, no. And you back the dropout, you back the, you know, the, you know, the you know, entrepreneur that are completely different from the other guy, and, then, uh, and that changed the whole business model. And those are the ones that are going to change the world. And so, you know, it's just um, you have to find your niches. And then, um, and also, U.S. has a tremendous opportunity. And uh, if you remember, in the 80s, everybody worried about Japan and you know, will, 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 will knock us out. And uh, I think the U.S. system is just very innovative, just keep reinvent uh, uh, ourselves. And so I think there's still a lot of opportunity. Yes, at the back. In what emerging industries do you see a lot of investment opportunity in China? Uh, in what emerging uh, industry you know, developing in China? And a uh, couple of areas. One, um, this um, alternate, uh, alternate energy clean tech is a very big area. Uh, if you've been to China, you know, the pollution is really bad. And they are about the same as U.S. in terms of the reserve for coal mine, and, uh, but coal are really polluting. And uh, if you've been to China, it's just really unbearable. And so I think the clean tech would be a very important one. And either solar energy, wind energy, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And uh, so that's one area. And then secondly, I think is this whole web 2.0, uh, digital media, we're just beginning. And then the mobile device, mobile application, and uh, it's going to be, you know, this entertainment going to be a very big thing because the people are a little bit more affluent now, and then uh, you know, they're looking for quality of life. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in that those sector. And the biotechnology, uh, life science, I think is tremendous opportunity. A lot of money being poured in uh, in some of those investments. And then the automotive uh, components, uh, government is very strongly support that industry. I think going to be a great one. And China also want to be like India. Uh, they want to be the largest uh, software IT service company, country. And so they are really try to follow India. And they have a very specific goal. China wasn't good about it. They don't debate. The government decided to do something, and they want to do it tomorrow. And they have the budget, and they're very decide, decisive on that. Yes? Yeah, talking about the China-U.S. relationship going forward. Uh, that's a very good question. And um, um, you know, I think uh, you know, and I'm on the Committee 100, and then we you know, kind of advising George Bush in some of the cases. And I think he have a better understanding of China. It's very important to include them as a partners rather than treat them as enemy. And uh, because I think China, U.S. need China. And when you're dealing with Korean and uh, North Korea, and then dealing, you know, so you need a partnership with China, and um, and then China is not a very confrontative, you know, Chinese uh, culture is not to be confronting, and so they will be a great partner if U.S. government allow them, and uh, they are the, the top priority for them is to build the economy, uh, you know, the low, you know, domestic economy, and uh, so there's still a long way to go. And uh, the last thing one they want is to uh, with an enemy with U.S. And so you're going to get the best collaboration uh, with you know U.S. government. And then, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes it's a very good opportunity to attack China, and uh, in, the, in the trade you know bal you know bad balance, and then uh, I try to restrict them. And I don't believe in it. I believe in free economic and free market.
Yeah, I think it's a good question in terms of uh, Japan relationship in this whole triangle. Um, China and Japan have a love-hate relationship uh, because of the historical. And I think you saw some of the publicity. They really want Japan to apologize for the, the, the World War and how they treat the, the China. And so I think deep inside, there's a lot of uh, you know, the uneasiness about that. And so I think uh, if you're dealing with China through Japan, I think it's the wrong way to do it. And I think you should just develop direct relationship with China. And, um, and uh, I think you know, in the past, Japan is a great partner for the uh, US. But I think for the political sensitivity, I think it's important to build a direct relationship with China. And uh, so they have a little bit more balance. And uh, you know, I think Japan also afraid of China and uh, because of their emerging growth in army and the military. Uh, and so I think it's a tricky one. You just have to balance that. Yes? What do you mean the international Talking about dealing with uh, multiple countries, you know, is it very, very important to have multiple languages skill set? Um, Answer is, uh, if you have that, it's nice to have. It would be great. And uh, that's why I was telling my two, two kids, uh, you know, learning Mandarin, just extra language, it, it will help you and, um, you know, in the future. And um, so it's always nice to have. And, um, but I think if you can't, is it the difficulty? Answer is no. You can always uh, find a partner that can speak the language. And then, uh, so I think it's not prohibit and then in some way people can speak in English. Now the difference between for us, you know, if there's a business plan come from a local Chinese don't speak English, the valuation is lower. <laughs> but if the you know the Chinese entrepreneur can speak fluent English with a beautiful PowerPoint, you know, the valuation is much higher. And uh, so it's just uh, relative valuations. And uh, so I think uh, you know, a lot of executive in US, you know, the, like Pat Gersinger and Intel and a few other are learning Mandarin now because it's become a very important language and um, it's, it's good to have. At least the culture, you're understanding their culture. And sometimes they say no, they, didn't, they don't politely say no, but they hint to you, this something is not going to work. And, uh, but if you don't grab it, understanding it, you know, you, you can be uh, misunderstood and you can and you know, not as an advantage for you. So not just a language, I think it's understanding the culture, the way they you know, the behave. And I think it's very important in terms of either doing business or conduct the negotiations. Yes? Very good question. Talking about investment, whether you come across area that you're going to have some conflict. And um, it's always have that. And uh, that's why I always, uh, the, one of my topics you know, I'm always interested is how to manage conflict. And uh, in life, you're going to always have some conflict uh, uh, somewhere. And then how you're managing that. And uh, so, for example, you invest in one company. Today, they may not have a conflict because the product is not directly confronting each other. But down the road, the company is going to expand, and then the other company is going to expand their area. Certain point in time, you're going to have some conflict. And uh, same thing in the building up business also. Uh, people may, sometimes it's good to have healthy conflict, and then you're managing that conflict. So if it's a good CEO, they usually like to have that conflict. So you bring in different people from different skill set, not the same uh, culture or not the same background, and then they confront each other and uh, argue about each other, and they usually bring the best if you're managing how to managing that. You know, the worst case is you, know, you bring everybody from Intel, you know, they, they think alike, they behave alike, then you don't get the best out of it. The last questions? Yes.
So you're talking about the control issue in terms of uh, in certain countries they don't allow you to control that. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, in terms of monitoring the control, the entrepreneur, what they can do, what cannot do. Okay. Yeah, that is a tricky one. And uh, usually you can put a lot of negative covenant, certain things you need the you know, the board approval, and certain budget of you know, you know, the capex that you buy. And uh, my philosophy is you, know, you can put whatever you want. The entrepreneur is going to do it anyway. And so it's very important you, know, you have a mutual understanding and then you can see straight in the eye that you can trust that person. And uh, if someone wants to cheat you, they can do anything you know, to cheat you. And so it's very important the integrity and then put some guideline. And then in some cases in Asia, you, know, you just cannot control. Like in US, the, the founding shareholder uh, don't have a lot of ownership. In Asia, it's the other way around. They have control. They fire you, not you fire them. And so I think in some way, you just have to make sure that you agree on certain common goal to accomplish, and, then, um, and also have some negative covenant. If you violate certain thing, then you may have to buy me out so that at least I can get out and, be, and uh, to at least get the exit.